We were considered missing and presumed dead, along with many others. After just a few days, many people were buried, and even more still unheard of, believed to have vanished with the storm. I share this story hoping that it will help many, or just you. Through vulnerability, I speak from an open heart. Please take it in with an open mind. Throughout this last year, I've carried this story inside of me, internalizing emotions and manifesting physical pains. Today, I'm ready to let go and close this chapter of my life. So I'm sharing partially for my own healing, but in hope that it can help someone come out of the darkness. My wish is that this serves you. But really, this is not about me or my family. This story is ultimately about the resilience of the human spirit. Healing requires giving it a voice and having a safe space for that voice to be heard. Here, I share my voice. How did we go from paradise to the apocalypse overnight? How did the lives of thousands become a nightmare in a few hours? Was the universe teaching us a lesson or was it simply redirecting us? All of our struggles are preparing us for what's coming. Like a tree that needs natural elemental stresses to become strong and resilient, we also need to be pushed out of our comfort zone so we can grow. Resilience. This word has been used a lot recently, with reason. We've been pushed out of our comfort zone many times this year, some days way past it. One year ago today, the dreams of many were destroyed. Many are still lost, with a life that does not have the same meaning as life before, a life that no longer matches their blueprint. But we all carry faith and hope, sometimes slipping back, but other days pushing forward. Morning came. I woke in shock. I broke down crying. Everything we had just worked on, our vision of 10 years, our lifetime of dreaming was gone overnight. But at the same time, I was overjoyed that my family and I were alive. We were one of the lucky families. Today in a parallel universe, we would have been enjoying another beautiful star-filled night, cooking breadfruit by the fire with our close-knit friends, laughing and talking about our homesteading discoveries of the week. We would be getting ourselves ready for Creole season, planning beach trips and river limes, relaxing in hot springs or going on another family hike. We would be putting our children to sleep in their own beds with hearts filled with joy after another beautiful day. We had a roof and a place to call home. Instead, we are homeless, we are jobless, we've been displaced, have had to say goodbye to our friends, our animals, our nest, our country and ultimately the life we knew a good life. But really, we know it's all just perspective. I will come to that later. Let's start from the beginning. On the night of September 18th, 2017, a superstorm brought life to a standstill on our island. Hurricane Maria is regarded as the worst natural disaster on record to hit the Commonwealth of Dominica. It caused catastrophic damage and a major humanitarian crisis. The storm evolved from a Category 1 to a Category 5 hurricane in less than 18 hours, making it one of the fastest strengthening storms ever recorded on the planet. It thrashed the country with extreme winds and torrential rain destroying all in its path. To this day, one year after the hurricane, the island is still restoring access to fresh running water and electricity in some parts of the country communication towers were snapped in two, causing an island-wide blackout. The cellular network was unreliable for months. The majority of the roads were blocked with debris and many of the bridges damaged. The country was in a daze, cut off from the world. Some described the country looking like it had a nuclear bomb dropped on it. Others said it looked like a war zone, or as if a volcano had erupted, or a giant fire had burnt the entire rainforest, island-wide. The breath of the destruction was staggering. Intact or untouched homes hard to find amid the chaos.
Now for our personal experience. Yes, we were in our house with our two small children during the hurricane. My husband is a well-known Calypsonian and singer-performer on the island. We had an online presence where we were known as the S Family, the creators of Beyond Vitality Nature Camp, a small family-run off-grid eco-lodge, homestead, and community. Our home, business, livelihood, and community was destroyed by the hurricane. My husband Stefan, daughter Skyla, who just turned five, and 18-month-old son survived the storm in our Cobb home, sheltered under a wooden closet while our house flooded and our roof was forcefully ripped off. We were sitting in the dark, not knowing if we would come out alive. It was just another day on the island. Tropical Storm Maria was in the Atlantic a day away, something common during hurricane season, but most storms either died down, headed north, or simply brought a lot of rain. We had some guests staying with us from Barbados and Trinidad, now really good friends of ours. Just 10 days prior, we'd had a scare. Hurricane Irma had missed our island. Now we watched Maria, just a tropical storm heading north of us. We felt safe and fortunate, but lingering in the back of our minds was St. Martin, Anguilla, US Virgin Islands, and British Virgin Islands, who were completely devastated. As the day went by, we spent more time online, checking the National Hurricane Center, on Skype with the kids' grandparents, and reassuring ourselves and everyone that everything would be fine. In everyone's mind, this tropical storm wasn't a direct threat, or the worst case scenario is that we would get hit from a category one or two hurricane. Just two weeks prior, we celebrated our daughter's fifth birthday. We had our usual potluck while we mingled around a variety of home-cooked local food made with love by our friends and homeschooling group of kitties. We laughed, cooled off in our stone pool, and watched the children play freely on the land. We ended the day with our usual bonfire jam session. Some sang, some danced, and the kids joined in until they fell asleep in our arms. Our friends departed back to their own little homesteads on the other side of the island, and we finished with our usual see you soon. Little did we know that was going to be the last time we saw them. We woke to the news of Hurricane Maria. It was no longer a tropical storm. It had been upgraded to a category one, which some anticipated. Okay, the worst. A category one may hit us, or it may stay south. We could weather it out. We prepared our home. The next update was posted. Maria was now a category two. Uh, okay, wait, what? A category two in just a few hours? And now heading south of us? we stepped up our preparations. We knew we would definitely get some weather. It's fine. We trimmed a few more trees and brought in some heavier items from the yard. All right, we're ready for our category two. Maria was coming from the east in the Atlantic. We were on the east coast with a view of the ocean directly exposed. That made us nervous. Maria was growing faster than anyone had anticipated. In the late afternoon, she grew to a category three and Dominica was on a hurricane morning. As the hours went by, we spent more and more time online, researching hurricanes, checking various weather channels, and laughing at the usual jokes and messages about Maria. These jokes gradually turned to concern. Now we found ourselves reassuring friends and family, looking for the best predictions, and hoping that the ones that suggested Maria would be a direct hit were incorrect. The wind started to pick up a little bit. Nothing major. Our home was in the middle of the rainforest, so we sent out GPS coordinates so we could get located in the worst case scenario. We had our usual dinner outside with our spectacular ocean and mountain view. The horizon was still clear, a beautiful calm before the storm. We bathed the kids a little earlier than usual and got ready to bunker down in our cop house for the night. We had fun setting up a little fort with our daughter's still bed, placing a mattress on one side, covering it all with tarps and tying it strongly with ropes. We joked that if parts of the roof went, we'd have something to go under. At that point, we knew we would get some weather, but never anticipated the monster Maria would turn into. As we prepared to bunker down in our room for the night, we checked the last update. Maria was now a category four. At this point, we started to consider what we would do, but there was no time to leave. 
We had our last conversation with grandpa and grandma on Skype and he suggested that we go near our red wooden closet as there were not many windows around it. Maria was still a category four and continued tracking south of us. By this time, it was far too violent outside to do anything. I started to nurse my baby to sleep while our daughter sat beside us anticipating, feeling our anxious energy. Right after that moment, the cell tower went down. The power was gone and the roar of the wind was increasing. We could hear many large bangs as objects hit the building. Our power cut out and last we had seen, Maria was a category four. We had no idea she was just about to grow to a catastrophic category five as she made landfall on Dominica. We put baby Sadiel to sleep on our bed. Scala helped us finish the fort. She was quite excited to play in it. Stefan and I discussed taking turns keeping watch. I had a feeling I wouldn't sleep much that night. Only 10 minutes later, the wind suddenly picked up very fast. Just then, we knew our plan of keeping watch was not going to happen. It was going to be a very long, terrifying, sleepless night for all of us. Dirt, leaves, and small debris started to come into our home. The gusts were now very strong. Rain started to mist into the house. Our hearts started to pound. I grabbed the baby off the bed, Stefan grabbed Skyla, we threw our mattress onto the floor beside our closet, grabbed all pillows and huddled in a little corner, holding the kids under our legs with pillows protecting them. We held each other and hugged them tightly. Things were happening very fast. We had to cover our eyes as dirt was flying all over. The kids kept getting some in their eyes and crying. They quickly learned to keep their heads down and eyes shut. We heard what sounded like the roof of our electrical room go. The sound was terrifying. Again, I must stress how incredibly stunned we were that everything was happening so fast. We never anticipated this. We were utterly shocked. The experience was surreal, from tucking our children into bed to fighting for survival. We tried to stay composed for the children as we brainstormed Plan C, as Plan D was no longer an option. The little fort we had built with Skyla's bed was not going to cut it for this monster storm. The water was now about four inches high. The house started to flood. Our bed was low to the ground, so we could not go under it. Wet, scared, and still lying on the mattress, we realized we were in trouble, deep trouble. Hope started to fade. I did not have confidence that our cob house would survive those winds, at least not our roof. But here we were, and it was real, and too late to leave. I knew there was nothing more we could do. Now a lot of water was getting into the house and seeping through the walls. Luckily, we were on our mattress as the floor started to flood. Then we heard what sounded like our veranda roof get ripped off. Bang! 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 As it slammed against the main roof. The wind was howling so loud, we couldn't hear ourselves talking. It was hard to see anything as it was dark outside. There was a lot of ripping and banging sounds. We could hear pieces of our house roof coming off one by one. We were not exactly sure what was happening until we felt the rain coming in through the wood beams. The sound was so loud, but we could only see the roof in 10 second flashes when lightning struck. The rain was now downpouring into the house. We were completely soaked and cold. The water level was rising. We could see our cats scrambling about, trying to find a safe space. Maka, Chia, and Orangey. The poor animals were scared, as we all were. Our dog Goji was hiding on our bed, dodging branches and flying debris. We hoped that our goats took refuge. I worried about glass exploding into the room. We soon realized that that was the least of our worries. We sat on our mattress trying to keep dry under pillows and blankets, but staying dry was no longer valid concern. We knew we had to quickly move on to more serious survival issues. Plan C, where were we going to evacuate to? Trying not to let fear overwhelm us, we knew the roof was going to go and our home and all our possessions would be soaked or swept away into the storm. Okay, reality check. None of that really mattered if we didn't live through the night. The roof was going. Trees would fly all over the place. Debris would come in. Would we get squashed? Would the wind take us away? Would everything collapse around us? How would we survive? As the wind gust grew stronger and stronger, we saw a flash of what was left of our house. The broken windows, the terrified animals, we were getting exposed. Stefan screamed into my ears, the roof is going to go. I screamed back, what? Again, he said, the roof is going. 
He got up, opened the door to our little red wooden closet, frantically took all our clothes out and threw them on the floor. I looked at him, hoping none of the projectiles hit him. He would lose an arm, or worse off, it could kill him. Now the kids and I had to also make it to the closet and climb in. He grabbed Skyla, took my hand, and I put Sadel in the closet and climbed onto the second shelf, the largest part of the closet which we had previously used as a diaper changing table for our son. Stefan gave me Skyla and he hopped in very quickly, shutting the doors as the wind tried to open them again. We both held them closed with all our force. Our timing was on point. This is when things got very intense. We kept thinking and discussing possible plan C. Plan D. What if all failed? We didn't know if the closet would withstand the forces of the wind. The kids knew something was terribly wrong. It was a little closet my dad had built in a day. We had faith in his building skills, but the fact that it was built with imported lumber and plywood doors was not good. Would it withstand the wind or would it simply collapse and expose us to the hurricane? My dad didn't exactly have hurricane shelter in his mind when he built it. Now it was keeping us safe and a little bit drier. That's fine. Through the cracks of the door, we could see objects flying into the house. Skyla huddled in a little ball holding her favorite stuffed animal sticks. Daddy held Skyla with one arm and the doors of the closet shut as the wind tried to forcefully open them. I helped when I could while reassuring Sadiel. The look on his face was pure shock. He was beyond even being able to cry. He was frozen and it is the longest he ever sat still. He was traumatized. We held the kids closely under some pillows. The adrenaline we felt was like we had never experienced. Our muscles remained tense, like we were holding a static weighted position for hours. As lightning came almost every second, this is when we saw the roof and its entire frame, rafters and all, started to disconnect. It would go up and down and hit our cob walls with immense force. It felt like an earthquake. Every time the wind picked it up and it crashed down, slowly breaking our cob walls. Ba-bang! Ba-bang! This was the most terrifying part. We prayed that the roof would not rise and then fall again, breaking our wooden closet on our heads, crushing us to death. Both children in shock and witnessing our expression, I started to tear up, wondering if this was the end, but also trying to keep it together for my children. The roof kept rising and falling back. It was just a matter of time. A few more gusts. What was going to be the outcome? We held the kids under us, protecting them of whatever could come crashing down. We prayed to the universe and all of creation to let the hurricane just take the roof into the sky, sparing us. The sound of the wind was deafening, a screaming, maleficent howl that seemed endless and constant. Finally, one intense, long and strong gust of wind came and we saw our entire roof and its frame disappear into the sky. <sighs> Good. It didn't fall onto our heads, but now we were completely exposed to the elements and the force of the storm. We were at the hurricane's complete mercy. I visualized a protective bubble around us, protecting us from all harm. Now that the roof was gone, the lightning gave us a clearer view of the extent of the damage. It was bad, worse than we ever imagined. Our entire house was a pile of debris with electrical cables everywhere, broken tree branches, and filled with water and mud. We thought we had a full cob wall behind us, but forgot that part of our bedroom door extended behind the closet with wood closing it up. We suspected that this got ripped off because the wind suddenly started to shake us in the closet. It was a total roller coaster ride. We were now completely exposed. It toppled side to side and back and forth, trying to tip us forward. Stefan and I pushed all of our body weight while trying to keep the doors closed. His arms were getting numb. Lactic acid was starting to burn. How much longer could he hold on? We felt absolutely helpless with the kids. We didn't know if we would be trapped in the closet or if it would fall forward and break our necks, or if we would get buried alive, or if the storm would push the closet down, trapping us underneath the flooding water, or if it would simply collapse and we would all disappear into the storm. I had horrifying visions of the wind taking my children, so I held them very tightly. Then I had visions of the wind taking us, but leaving my children behind to fend for themselves. Our mind rambled to all different scenarios. I had to consciously stop the thoughts and continue to pray and visualize our protective bubble.
Another strong gust came and we knew the closet would fall forward. We all fell with it. We pushed the doors open, which kept the closet from falling down on our heads and completely trapping us under it. This is when the universe truly was on our side. We fell forward holding the kids, but luckily right on top of the mattress we had put onto the floor. And the closet was just long enough to catch an inch of our bed to hold it up enough to give us enough space to sit in the little shelf we were in under the closet. Its doors opened just enough for us to have an escape route and be able to see part of our bedroom to look around for options. The kids cried hysterically as the fall woke them up, not knowing why they were in the cold water, not knowing why there was a howling monster outside, wondering why they weren't in their beds. They were confused. They were in absolute fear. They panicked. We remained sitting and holding one child each on the water drenched mattress. It was cold and the rain was coming down. We fell on top of some wet clothes, which we were able to put on the kids to keep their body heat in. The kids continued to cry. Make it go away, they said. My children were afraid. I was afraid. I had to go deep within. I quickly calmed myself, got back into my body and reassured them, also reassuring myself. It was okay. It was all going to be over soon. We were protected. The closet was going to save us, our beloved protective bubble. We started to sing to them. It relaxed them. It relaxed us. So completely exhausted, their bodies shut down and they fell into a deep slumber. As the wind continued, the hurricane tried to take the closet from us. Stefan held it down with all of his body weight. It was so much for him that Scala joined me and Sadiel at the back of the closet and Stefan stood in a deep squat holding the closet down for hours. Our lights were now malfunctioning. We were down to one dim headlight. Still the wind screeched and howled. We could hear our home deteriorating around us, further exposing our little bubble. We held on to our children tighter. We held on to the closet with dear life. We love that closet. The only thing that could save us was the closet. It was between us and Maria. Now heading to the middle of the night, the winds and rains were amplified by the fear of complete darkness and the unknown. The deafening noise, the intense vibrations, the rumbling and the shaking all made us long for daylight. There were crashes and love bangs with the entire world collapsing around us. This sense of claustrophobia, suffocation, hopelessness, nowhere to go. We continued to pray and visualize. Have you ever been through an earthquake, a flood, a tornado with the atmospheric pressure and noise of a plane all at once? The pressure change even popped our ears. It felt as if we were in a crashing plane actually. That is the best way some have described the experience. Maria tried to take the closet from us for two hours trying to expose us, but Stefan held on with all of his strength until his legs hurt, his arms numbed, and his hands were sore. I held on to the two sleeping kids. By then, not only had they peed their pants, I had as well. The fear was just too much and the cold of the water was moving into our bodies. I held the kids close, trying to keep them warm while we sat in cold water. I covered them with whatever damp clothes I could find. Wet pillows protected them, and the closet still stood strong. Our bubble held strong. Occasionally, we peeked out. We couldn't see much. It was too risky to pop out our heads. Branches and trees had fallen over the closet. We didn't know if we could even come out. But for now, we stayed put. We felt safe. A weight off my shoulders was lifted. When I felt my body collapse into trust, it wasn't up to me anymore. I couldn't control the outcome. I had to trust. The universe had our back. Either we would make it out or we would go that night together peacefully with our children in our arms. We fought hard and now we were tired. I tried not to think anymore. This may be the end. We held on to each other, scared, in the dark, occasionally checking if everyone was still alive and unharmed. We kept telling each other and the children that it was okay, but deep down we knew it wasn't okay. But what was okay is that we were together as a family. We remained calm and peaceful. I watched my children sleeping, joyfully reminiscing about all the beautiful memories we shared together in our home. We were sore, we were cramped, with less than two feet to move around. We managed to find a wet raincoat to cover the kids. For hours, they had been in wet, cold clothes. But the fatigue took over and they still slept. Finally, the gust decreased and we were able to relax our tense muscles for the first time in hours. We were not sure if the storm had passed or if this was simply the eye going through. 
We didn't want to take any chances, so we waited. After 15 minutes, Stefan came out of the closet to evaluate the situation to see if we could run to another part of our house or vehicle. He came back in quickly and said, nope, we're staying here. It's worse than what we thought. We decided to stay in the closet because it was the safest place remaining. It had protected us through the first part of the storm. It would protect us for the wet was remaining. And we knew that the next part of the storm couldn't possibly be worse than the first part. There was nothing left to rip and throw down. We hoped that we had passed the worst. Stefan screamed out to see if anyone in the other building responded. He heard voices, but it was too far and too dark to go see. This was our story. Meanwhile, our guests were in our wooden accommodation building we call the hammock hut. They had their own survival story. Little did we know they were trapped in their rooms during the furiousness of the storm while a landslide slowly started to fill their space with mud. They were on their beds while the mud started to come up and up and up. The entire mountain was collapsing due to all the trees being uprooted by the winds. We remembered researching and viewing many photos of the winds in hurricanes. We knew that for the second half, the winds would be coming from the other direction. This made us nervous. We had survived the first part, but now what more could be destroyed? We had so little remaining. <sighs> Only four more hours to go. The second half was just as furious and intense as the first, but we had better expectations. We knew to expect the worst. Thus, it felt shorter and we were more prepared, but additional structures collapsed and more debris was thrown around. Stefan was absolutely exhausted to be holding down the closet. The kids were still sleeping, so I placed them aside and helped him. Then the wind started to get intense again. Our heart rate went up and our muscles tense. One large gust after another came, every 5 to 15 seconds. Gust after gust, we continued to pray that it would not be worse than the first part, which was unimaginable. The kids slept and we braced ourselves and protected them with pillows. We tried to keep them warm. Adrenaline took over again, so we were absolutely numb. The kids were lying there shivering. We feared hypothermia. After about another hour of destructive wind, we started to feel it go down again. We knew the worst was over. At this point, nothing mattered except that we were alive and that we needed to get the kids to a dry and warm location as soon as possible. Time was of essence. Their lips were blue. They were shivering uncontrollably, too tired to wake, too tired to walk. We waited very impatiently and counted down the minutes until the wind seemed manageable to walk in. Finally, the conditions were safe. The rain continued to downpour, but we could deal with that. We needed to move. We needed to fight for our children's survival. We were all beginning to be extremely cold. Finally, it was time to emerge from our survival pod. We could come out of our protective bubble. The front door and part of the wall had been ripped off and that the trees were covering our exit to the car, but it was the only safe location. We covered the kids in a raincoat and trekked through the broken glass debris and fallen trees. On our way out, we managed to find a semi-dry piece of clothes for both of them, but no diapers. We climbed over and under the trees on the way to our vehicle. What would have normally been a 10 second walk took us five minutes. We changed the kids and put them in their car seats to sleep. Luckily, they were completely exhausted, so they slept soundly. We had a few minutes to think. It was incredibly cold and we were still wet. Daddy returned to the house in search of dry clothes and the car keys. We were in luck. How incredibly happy we were for this small yet grand accomplishment. We immediately turned on the car and cranked up the heat. For the first time ever in the rainforest, we were using heat. We were finally dry and relaxed enough to have a little conversation about what now. We reclined our seats and tried to sleep. Stefan slept. He can sleep anywhere. I tried, but no luck. My mind was rambling as I sat there in utter shock. Sadiel woke once to nurse. He peed all over me, but luckily slept again. Being covered in pee was something normal by now. The storm knocked out communications for the entire country, leaving anyone outside of Dominica struggling to determine the extent of the damage. Maria silenced all communication to the outside world. Little did we know it would be days until anyone could hear from us. I sat there not able to sleep with mixed emotions, 
denial and shock that our world could have been erased overnight, but also joyful ecstasy to be alive. I continued counting down the hours until dawn, 2 a.m., 3, 4, 4 5.30, 5.45, and finally 5 a.m. It felt like the longest night ever. At last, the sun started to rise, but not many birds chirped. It was quiet, with the rain still drizzling down. I tried to get a clear view of outside, but with the dim light, rain, and foggy windows, I could only see in close proximity. Everyone continued to sleep. I sat there eagerly waiting. Minute by minute, nighttime turned to dawn. The sky went from black to gray. The windows were fogged up. Everyone was still sleeping, so I waited a little longer for better visibility. The rain poured down. Stefan woke up. We talked a little bit about what our plan would be. We had no plan. We rambled on about thousands of ways our life would probably change. The kids remained sleeping. Finally, the rain stopped for a little period. I took a deep breath and opened the car door to take my first step into mud and debris. I looked into the valley ahead of us and saw desolation. What was once the lush green valley we woke to every morning was now just a landscape of brown and black destruction ripped of all its foliage. It looked as if there had been a massive forest fire or volcanic eruption. All trees had been uprooted, broken down the middle, or lost all of their leaves, branches, and bark. Yes, the forces of the wind had completely debarked the trees. The rainforest was gone. I emerged into a new world, a world which looked like the apocalypse. We could see for miles out. At that point, we knew the destruction was countrywide. As I turned back to look at the mountain where our beautiful Cobb home was nestled under, my knees got weak. Utterly in shock, I broke down in tears. Stefan hugged me. We were both in disbelief. Everything was unrecognizable. Our home was gone. It did not even look like home anymore. Parts of it stood there, roofless, with pieces scattered all over the land. All structures and vegetation on our six acres of mountainous tropical rainforest were wiped out or severely damaged, apart from the last remaining structure where our friends were staying, but which filled up with mud from the landslide. The kids woke up. They had no reaction. The look on their faces was though their minds couldn't comprehend what was happening. They asked about their animals and their toys. On the bright side, our dog Goji and goats Baba and Gigi were alive. But there was no sign of the cats. The kids were especially focused on them. They would call out, Maka, Chia, Orangey, but no kitties came. They felt sad. The path to our house was blocked by fallen trees. The majority of our crops were destroyed. Almost every single one of our hundreds of fruit trees had fallen and our gardens uprooted or covered by landslide and debris. Our guest cabins no more, completely wiped out. Our house looked like a bomb had dropped down, the roof gone, tree branches inside our bedroom, everything thrown all over the floor and drenched. Doors gone, windows flown off, and broken glass everywhere, our personal possessions full of mud and wet, or flown off with the wind. Our kitchen in a disaster, with part of the roof off, our dining area and veranda gone. Our bathroom and roof and its doors gone. Half of our solar panels flew off with the wind, and the electrical wires all ripped off. No electricity. Our spring and settling tank all gone and destroyed by large fallen trees. Our only remaining roof and structure was the hammock hut and guest rooms, but the large landslide had filled it with mud waist deep. Our composting toilets turned over and brought down with the mud. We had nowhere to dry clothes and start putting salvage materials. The rain continued to pour down for the rest of the day. With nowhere dry to go, the kids and I stayed in the car for a combined 20 hours. They were cold and wet. The men, still in shock, went to salvage the chainsaw. Luckily, it still worked. They cut their way out of our driveway only to see that the rest of our half-mile feeder road down to the main road was impassable with more than 50 fallen trees. Everyone still in denial and not thinking clearly, trying to salvage any dry clothes from blue bins of old pieces we were going to donate. 
We also salvaged some cloth diapers from the mud and washed them, but it was going to be a while until they could dry. We waited for the sun. The rain continued, so the kids and I were obligated to stay in the car. The day was long with two small children trying to entertain them in a car for hours on end. We salvaged a few toys and they were happy with the simplicity of the situation. The guys took a trek down through all the trees to see if our nearest neighbors were alive. Their roof had also been ripped off. They helped them put a piece of galvanize up so they could get a bit of dry space. They were given some frozen meats to use up as they would have all gone to waste without electricity. We found some dry blankets and towels which we set up in our SUV to rough out the night. We cleaned the kitchen enough for some of our guests to hang hammocks and the others stayed in their rental car. We all ate dinner early that evening and we went back to our vehicles which was the only clean and dry spot we had. Light wind moved a loose piece of galvanized that had detached from the shed roof. It brought post-traumatic stress of the storm all night long. Were we in a nightmare, or was this all real? The children were terrified the hurricane would return. We all were. The kids slept, and we slept, a little bit. It was very uncomfortable, but we were grateful to be dry and safe. The wind eased, but the rain kept going for two days. I felt much more refreshed and able to handle the children and myself. It was still drizzling rain, but we were able to find raincoats to go explore our new world. The kids were getting restless not having the freedom to play and run around as they were used to. Their wild playground was now a pile of debris with sharp galvanized wood, rusty nails, electrical cables and broken glass. They would soon learn to maneuver around these grounds as we adults had no choice but to start thinking and working for our survival. For the first time, we brought them into their destroyed home. They saw all of their scattered clothes, their books, their favorite stuffed animals, close to nothing remaining or worth salvaging. It didn't look like home anymore. All of our years worth of memorable treasures, a library I had built over 20 years, family heirlooms, photo albums, the kids memory boxes, school diplomas, important documents, electronics and more, all gone in the span of a few hours. Our roof had gone and our cob walls were now deteriorating in the rain. It was unlivable. Our main priority was to keep ourselves healthy and emotionally available for the children so we could be the strongest and most capable parents. As much as we wanted to start salvaging our prized possessions, we had to conserve our energy. Even once we gathered enough energy, we first had to clean up, make space and build temporary roofs to store things. An ordeal that would probably take days without proper materials and our tools scattered all over the land not knowing if they even worked anymore. 
What had not been taken by the storm was now getting drenched in the rain. Everything was wet and soggy. We did the best we could in the situation, trying not to overwhelm our minds with this enormous task. Where would we ever start? We just had to stop thinking. Survival was our only mission. We had an odd but good breakfast of guava oatmeal and ground meat. All fruit trees had fallen, so there was an abundance of ripe fruit, until they would all start to ferment and rot in a few days, in the scorching heat without refrigeration. We placed them in buckets of water in the shade. Our cats showed up that day, all three of them, one by one at different times. It was beautiful to see the smiles on the children's faces. We were all happy to see our kitties. The rain continued, so we took any little dry span within the day to get as much done as we could. It was impossible to dry the baby diapers. We turned on the car with the heat to dry them enough to dampness. We also spent much of our time collecting rainwater and boiling water for drinking. The sun came out. We frantically put out all our clothes. Then we decided to take a walk to Casa Bruce to see if there was any communication in the village. We looked for the keys for our ATV. Success! Oh, but wait, the roads are impassable. Scratch that. We drove the kids with the ATV halfway down our feeder road up to where the guys had cleared with the chainsaw, but the rest of the way we had to walk. This six mile round way mountainous walk felt longer than ever. It resembled a true apocalypse scene. All roofs were gone, some houses flattened, many community structures deteriorated to piles of rubble and debris, thousands of trees uprooted and roads lifted, water pipes also uprooted, and communication towers snapped. We must have crossed at least 200 fallen trees that blocked the main road to the village. The green was gone. Well accustomed to the abundance of nature, we foraged some guavas, grapefruits, and avocados from fallen trees. Arriving to the village was surreal. We walked through the village asking about some of our friends' whereabouts. Some were okay, some still had not been seen. Community members, all in shock, some more than others, some completely losing their minds, and others had the best brought out of them. Different people dealt with the trauma in various ways. Everyone shared their survival stories, some absolutely miraculous, some incredibly painful. People who had lost limbs, others who had lost lives. Unique stories all in their own, truly demonstrating the resilience of the human being. As we walked through the roads, we found ourselves full of empathy, feeling everyone's pain as we tried to manage our own. We grabbed a few staples at a small corner store, but just as much as we could carry with the kids. We walked down to the beach to rest and snap. The kids got to swim in a little river. The beach had completely changed, the landscape so different. We departed again for our journey. It was much longer on the way back. It started to rain. But this was the first time we had all laughed and danced in the rain again, barefoot in the middle of the road, with not a single car or soul in sight. For the rest of the day, we worked at making dinner from early afternoon as everything took much longer with having to gather and boil rainwater and no light after sunset. Luckily, our apocalyptic meals were pretty gourmet, considering we were stranded with one of our friends who was also a chef. Between all of our cooking, foraging, and permaculture knowledge, we were surviving just fine. In fact, we may have been eating better than some people on a normal day. We ate early, bathed the kids and ourselves with some rainwater in a blue container that had filled overnight. We carefully used any water left on the property as we did not know if rainfall would stop. And access to our spring and stream was still blocked. We hadn't gathered enough energy to tackle that mission yet. We had to get the kids to bed quite early as we had nowhere but the car to go once the rain came and the sun went down. Every day forward, it was a mission to have everyone fed, bathed, and ready for bed before 6 p.m., just shortly after the sun went down. We slept soon after the kids fell asleep. Our circadian rhythm was set back to its natural balance. We had no lights except the headlights we had on our heads and some candles, but we were trying to ration even lights as we didn't know how long our batteries would last. Being without technology, lights, and distraction was kind of bittersweet. The loss of our home and shelter led us to spend more quality time together as a family, almost like on a camping trip, but 
with a different level of survival intensity and emotional trauma and post-traumatic stress lingering. The remainder of the week, our holistic health rewilding and off-grid skills were put to the test as we had to continue sheltering in our vehicle, collecting rainwater, forage for food, and treat some of our minor injuries with plants from the landscape. Our quality of sleep increased a little bit every night. We managed to dry out our yoga mats and put them under us to sleep in the car. We also set up a car as a play car, aka playpen for the kids, which we put them in when we had to work and do anything that was unsafe for them to be around. We awoke early that morning, around 4 a.m. The kids slept a little bit longer and rose shortly after. They were doing pretty well considering all they had lost and after seeing their demolished home and all of their things in the muddy water, the children were much better with the law of impermanence, not attaching themselves to anything they had lost, but a few of their favorite stuffed animals, which we prioritized drying. I'll speak a little more about this law later on. In fact, the kids were very grateful and captivated by the whole situation. As sad and happy it made me all at once, during the intense moments, Scala became more responsible to take care of her baby brother. She held his hand as they walked over broken wood and rusty nails, got him snacks and water, and knew she had the duty of entertaining and playing with him in the play car to keep him out of harm's way as the adults worked to salvage and clean areas to make spaces somewhat safe and livable. The sun was up that morning. We frantically washed more baby diapers and hung them on tree branches. Our chef friend made an amazing banana bread also. To this day, I can still taste it. It's like all of our senses became heightened in the survival mode. The simplest and smallest things gave us so much joy. We were truly living in the moment. I sometimes have to bring myself back to those moments and remember what life is really about. We were so grateful to have been stranded with such a compassionate and helpful group of friends we could sense true community spirit. The resilience and caring nature of human beings is remarkable. As disorganized and traumatized we all were, we managed to make it work. From my perspective, everyone had a specific role and we worked well as a team. Shortly after breakfast, we had to say our goodbyes. Our friends worked up enough energy to pack up and hike to the capital. They packed their bags very lightly. We said our farewells and they took off for their journey to the capital by foot through broken down road, landslides, and fallen trees. It took them 11 hours to arrive, and then they had to sleep on the street when they arrived to Roseau. Our family chose not to go, as we didn't think it was wise for us to leave with two small children just yet. With such a long trek, in the blazing sun, no proper shoes, so much unknown. The capital could have been in a worse state. Then what? The stream wasn't accessible from one side due to a big tree blocking it, and the other was an immense landslide and fallen trees as well, but we were soon going to be out of rainwater because the sun was shining brighter now. With the sun, we were able to salvage a single mattress and dry it enough to put it in the back of our vehicle. Hooray! Our quality of sleep was going to increase a lot. We were excited for this new luxury. We did our bath and dinner routine before the sun went down and got into the car. Our comfort level was good, but the night was very hot and humid. Apparently there was another tropical depression arriving, which we didn't know of at the time. The air was very heavy. Luckily, there was no mosquitoes. We slept okay. Having the mattress in the car was a major improvement. With all the sun, we had no more rainwater collecting though. We had to make the trip down to the stream with the kids, which was on a steep cliff that eroded. It took a while, but we managed. The kids enjoyed swimming in the newly created river pools left by the storm. Our stream had completely changed, more than any other storm had done. It was a long trek back, carrying kids and water, but we made it. For the first time since the storm, we were now drinking stream water instead of boiled rainwater. We came up and made lunch. We enjoyed it in the sun at our dining table where we used to have dinner every night. The view was still spectacular, but different, apocalyptic-like. We joked that a zombie would probably come around the corner soon. Every few hours, we saw helicopters go by, heading towards the village. The kids got excited every time they flew in the valley. 
Dominica's once gorgeous mountain and rainforest landscape, which also helped drive ecotourism to the island, was a bit of a curse in the efforts to deliver emergency aid to villages, which were totally cut off due to landslides, collapsed roads and bridges. Aid was only available by air. Prior, the lush rainforest kept the air cool and humid. Now, the atmosphere felt very dry, hot and sunny due to the lack of foliage. The poor birds. The few that we did see would flock like vultures at any food we dropped or ravage our plates if we left them for a second. Food sources were low. The flowers that the hummingbirds enjoyed by our veranda were not there anymore, and neither were the grapefruits that the parrots liked. We witnessed parrots trying to strip the little bit of bark that was remaining on the trees. It was saddening. We would see dead birds here and there. It was very sunny, so we spent the day drying more blankets and sheets, salvaging what we could to make life easier. Food was starting to get low. We figured we could survive three more days on staples and then we would be down to foraging coconuts and hunting crabs. It was doable. We didn't mind the simple diet, as long as it kept us strong and healthy. After disaster period, we realized how much of a need there was for people to rediscover and apply the use of herbal medicine and being able to forage and identify plants that had survived almost all native plants because they were more resilient. The focus needed not to be on canned, low vibration, low nutrition relief items, but on the medicinal and nutritious array of wild plants that survived such an environmental disaster. And that showed us what true self-sufficiency was and ultimately true independence and security in situations like this. We finished the day with our usual evening routine, dinner, bath in a bucket, nurse, sing the kids to sleep. Sleep was getting easier as we got accustomed to our new home, the car. Just after rising, we made it down to our stream again. We had a nice refreshing bath. We had worked on clearing the path the day before, so it was easier to get down this time. We proceeded with our usual routine, a Zoss's task to cook, carrying up drinking water, washing the baby's diapers, drying the baby's diapers, lunch, repeat, dinner, bed before sunset. It was all a lot. Perhaps we were pushing ourselves a little too much. Our mind was starting to process the situation. We were moving from denial to frustration. Overwhelm. Stefan and I had a bad argument in front of the kids. Okay, now guilt. After lunch, in the early afternoon, the Trinidad Coast Guard helicopter appeared. Our overwhelm increased. Were we ready to leave our home? Several villagers arrived at the same time. Then the Trinidad crew landed and hiked up the mountain. After being alone for so long, how could everything be happening so fast, all at once? Shortly after, the Venezuelan helicopter arrived. Two helicopters showed up at the same time. The Trinidad crew told us to pack our bags and come with them. The thought that we would be rescued that day had not even crossed our mind. But, but, I still had to make dinner for the kids, and I still had to dry diapers. I wasn't even dressed. We also thought about the rest of the possessions we had to salvage and safeguard. The remains of our home were still fully exposed to the elements and now we realize for the taking. Some of the villagers encouraged us to go with a lot of enthusiasm, a little too much enthusiasm. They said they would protect everything but they looked very eager as they asked where our chainsaw was and the keys for our ATV and our vehicle, etc, etc. It was clear now, we were going to get looted if we left. The little that remained was going to disappear. I wanted to stay put. We were fine. We were alive and this was our home. But then I looked back. Where was our home? The crew explained to me that the situation on the island was going to be unlivable, especially with young children. There was already a food and water shortage and the island was in a state of emergency, which was expected to last for months. At this point, Stefan said, go. You go with the kids. You need to keep them safe and bring them back to stability. He wanted to stay to protect our home from looters. He also wanted to stay back to care for our animals. According to a post made by the Ministry of National Security, we had been living in a car in the middle of nowhere since Hurricane Maria. Yes, we had indeed been living in our car, but this middle of nowhere to us was our home, our beloved homestead, surrounded by rainforests. Perhaps now, yes, it did look like the middle of nowhere, the middle of a war zone actually. So we trekked down the mountain half a mile to the main road through the fallen trees and desolated rainforest where the Venezuelan helicopter awaited us on a mound. As I carried my baby in the backpack and my daughter was in the hands of a complete stranger, I missed my husband already. 
Tears dripped down my face as I moved into greater unknown. I had no idea when I would see him again, no idea when the children would see their father, and in fact, didn't know where we would end up. Completely exhausted and slightly dehydrated, we climbed into the helicopter, leaving behind everything. Years of memories, our network of friends, our animals, our home where our son had been born, the nest for my children, their father, and my husband. As it lifted us up into the air, I saw a glimpse of our home, and within two seconds, it was gone. We flew off into the unknown, not knowing where we would end up, not knowing when and if we would ever be able to return, not knowing when we would see Stefan again. The uncertainty was incredibly overwhelming. We saw the destruction. It was staggering. I was indeed in denial, and at that moment, I wish we could turn around to get my husband, to tell him he was in a disaster zone, to tell him it was unsafe, that he could starve, that he could get sick, that people could come up and steal from him. He barely had enough to survive, but it was too late. I was now alone, single mother with two kids. Weeks passed and somehow, with all the exhaustion, I still couldn't shut my mind off. I was still in Dominica. My heart was still on the island. And as I lay in my comfortable bed, I thought of my husband and everyone on the island toughing out yet another few weeks in the rain and nights sleeping in cars or tents. I experienced tremendous survival's guilt. That is what I woke with in the morning. And homesickness. Our home was no more, but I was grateful for life. I kept repeating this thought in my mind. I experienced full-on culture shock. Everyone tried to help, and they did help a bit. I'm so very grateful to have support networks in multiple countries, but I felt alone, like nobody could relate. Nobody could truly understand the life we had and the life that was now gone overnight. Everyone reassured me that it would be okay, that I could simply stay with my parents and rebuild my life in Canada. But what about the life I had already built in a faraway land, which was now my land, my home? It was surreal to be in Canada. From being trapped in the rainforest and living in our vehicle for a week to having so much comfort again, I didn't know how to receive it all. I was amazed by people's kindness and generosity. Before we had even been evacuated, fundraisers had been put together. We had been touched by incredible people around the globe. Dominica was down, but not out. We felt part of the Dominica Strong that would return and help the island come back even stronger. Our family had a new perspective on what it meant to be alive and what it meant to work in community. Living in the now and appreciating the small things had never been of greater importance. At that point, our family was still planning to proceed with the beginning phase of our eco-village vision, which was being manifested just before the storm. We planned to return to the island where we would assess the situation and begin the rebuilding process with a climate resilient and sustainability goal in mind. It would be a long road to recovery, but not an impossible one. We proceeded with this plan, but it did not go as planned. Life in the aftermath was like no life I'd ever imagined. Some days were heart-wrenching, very difficult, working long hours in the rain into the night, 
trying to rebuild without building materials or many resources, all of us trying to sort out our financial troubles, our family crisis, internalizing stress as health complications, and dealing with emotional trauma. But the word we heard was resilience. Yes, everyone living in Dominica did have a lot of resilience and continues to build it today, as some are still scattered across the world or struggling to make it happen on the island, anticipating what the next hurricane season will bring. But as life is, they will bounce back. We will bounce back. It will take a long time. I had never met such a strong, most resilient group of people as I knew in Dominica. Dominicans themselves, and those who had also adopted the island as their new home. It takes a special kind of human to live so close to nature, untouched in all its mighty wild curves and rugged edges. The simple life is not for all, but those who chose it, value it. In an interview after the storm, Dr. Lennox Honeychurch, a resident historian of the island, shared what had always been the Caribbean experience going back hundreds of years to the original indigenous communities. He talked about massive hurricanes of the past showing that the emotions of hopelessness and discouragement were always the same quoting ancestors. We will never recover. There is nothing left. Too difficult to rebuild. Regardless how the survivors felt directly after the disasters, the inhabitants of Dominica showed resilience and always proceeded with rebuilding. And without a doubt, as exhausting as the task seemed, this was going to be the case again. Dominica was facing a big challenge, but also given a unique opportunity to rebuild as the first climate resilient country in the world. Many were using the term rebuild, but why were we so rushed to revisit the past? What we needed was a rebirth, a shift in paradigm, a paradigm for the next generation, as our friend Aaron Hawkins would say. What are we leaving behind for the children of the future? There is no space for old ways of thinking anymore. In this time of immense change and transition, not only in Dominica, but the entire planet, with all its suffering, we've been given the opportunity to break down the old paradigm and rebirth into this new world. The earth was just doing what she does when Hurricane Maria made landfall. The earth doesn't need healing, humanity does. No, it's time. For the next generation Something old, something new And the path beyond Pass it on, it's up to you Pass it on to the children of the future Oh, won't you rise and shine Children of the future, you are, you are, you are the children of the future. you light it now sometimes a spark can become a flame it's in your heart it's in your hands and you know it's time pass it on pass it on pass it on to the children of the future we need to change our level of thinking and join forces with our earth not work against her so many people describe the aftermath as a war zone but if we continue to think we are at war with our planet, we'll only further separate. What we need is to reunite and understand that we are one with the earth and all its organisms. Not above, not below. We're all one and the same. All energy. The beauty that is right in front of us. Nature is the means in which the creator or the universe communicates with us most forcefully. We are connected to nature. Whatever we do to nature affects us and whatever nature does affects us.
Think about working on an important document for an entire day or even a week, and then your computer crashes. You lose it all. You've put your heart and soul into that piece. Discouraging, right? Now visualize your dream. After years, you've manifested and created the dream, worked on it for years. Then, overnight, the system crashes. It's all gone. That's what the people of Dominica felt the night Hurricane Maria came and pressed delete. The past year has been the most difficult transition I've ever experienced. In a search to find home again, after a decade, I found myself back in the town I grew up in. The past year has been the most difficult transition I've ever experienced. In a search to find home again, after a decade, I found myself back in the town I grew up in. I arrived empty-handed, but now with two small children and alone. The hardest moment in my life was getting into that helicopter and leaving my community, my home, my husband. I had to dive deep and find home within, as the feeling of not having a nest for my children anymore was unbearable. But what happened was beautiful. We were indeed forced to find home within, and through that, find joy in every single moment. For the first time in my life, I knew what it truly meant to transcend and live in the now, to focus on just being, not doing. My purpose had become being the best version of myself, my higher self, in every moment. My purpose was to be. But the healing happened in phases. I would move forward and then slip back, progress and then regress. A year later, I still am. Watching the documentary The Shift by Wayne Dyer, he shared an important message. What I understood was that all of our purpose, it's in there. It becomes like a mantra of the ego. You have to have more. And the more you have, the more you become aware of how much people are trying to take it away from you. You get consumed with how to protect it and how to make more of it. The dilemma here is that if you are what you have and things go away, then who you are also goes away in the process. My last year has been spent simply trying to find employment, stability, and a home for my children. Perhaps I don't need to start all over again. Perhaps I just need to change my thoughts. Are we not all just energy? Abundance can flow through me, if I let it. I know that within all of this pain and loss, there was a lesson. This was the universe giving me the opportunity to grow. I could lose, but I could not lose the lesson for my own sanity and to make space so I could be emotionally available for my children, I had to physically, mentally, and emotionally detach. I had to implement every self-care tool I had learned in my years as a holistic practitioner. I implemented high vibe nutrition, I practiced movement, but most of all, I had to go within. I practiced meditation. 
Just when I needed it, I came across this amazing article about making peace with the law of impermanence by my friend Letitia Joy Tapping, founder of Teachings from Within. She also was affected by Hurricane Maria. She wrote, 2017, the year Hurricane Maria touched my life and the one of so many. The year I learned that everything you've spent years building can disappear in the blink of an eye. Home, land, possessions, relationships, positions, we never really own any of these. To be grateful for what we have today is good, but only if it doesn't come with even more fear of losing it tomorrow. And only if it comes with the realization that the present moment is all you have, all you ever had, and all you ever will. This is true liberation from the pointless fight against the law of impermanence that governs all things and all beings. Imagine what this world could be if all of us humans, as a species, stopped denying this essential law and lived our lives, embracing it instead of fearing it. This does not mean one should stop planning for the future, desiring things or seeking progress. But it means that our feeling of wholeness or of our life being meaningful should not rely on the realization of those things or on any accomplishment. For if we keep procrastinating our sense of fulfillment to a hypothetic future salvation while reducing the present moment to a means to an end, denying it as being the only access door through which genuine contentment could ever possibly be felt, then our accomplishments may bring us temporary relief and excitement, but it will be short-lived, quickly overshadowed by a haunting feeling of anxiety inherent to any position. The future of loss, of annihilation, which is essentially the fear of death. True joy is to be found inside of us, at our core, nestled in the only part of us which was always there and always will be, the essential energy within which makes and connects all that is. Here lies pure joy, always there, available and indestructible. If you've never touched it, you may not acknowledge its existence. It is hiding behind the thick cloud cover of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions hiding behind the wide spectrum of distractions and addictions we filled our lives with in a desperate attempt to cope with the pain created by our disconnection from life's primary purpose, which simply is to be. By practicing minimalism under its many forms, it becomes possible to unload all that doesn't serve us, that is, practically everything we've junked up our minds and our homes with, and see through again. Only then can we reconnect with the authentic joy of being, which can be experienced through our body as a subtle feeling of aliveness, as spiritual teacher Edgar Tolle describes it. A joy which is not conditioned to external circumstances and which doesn't require me or my life situation to change in order to be attained, for it is readily accessible at any given time lying behind the curtain. In 2017, I lost a dream, but I gained a life. When you are stripped down to nothing but your raw core, you are forced to look at who you really are without all of those things. I had to redesign my life to fit this new paradigm. Just like the island in the aftermath, I was going through my own rebirth process. Our entire family was. We had to do a ton of deep inner work and emotional healing and will continue to strive for self-mastery. Our ego was challenged, our belief systems were shattered, we had to rewire our brains, dive deeper into spirituality, detox and purge our body and mind, and experience the despair of yet another awakening. We were creating change, living in the now. I made a choice. Happiness was a choice. I chose happiness. So I asked once again, who am I? And this is when we reawaken to our purpose and mission in this world. Going through this experience was reaffirming that this was always part of my purpose and my path. I also have a ton of tools I can confidently reach for as a preventative and healing measures. We are creators. We had to provide for ourselves. We no longer were going to be codependent. We have big plans. Life starts now. Before and after the storm, we had lived in community, sharing life together with others and helping each other day to day. It was something very special to be sharing tasks in company while also feeling valued and appreciated. The power of community support is real. We are not
not meant to go at this life alone. With community, we have the strength of living this life beyond just surviving. We can thrive. And that is what we stand for at Beyond Vitality. I felt that way back when I founded my vision, and I feel it now. We are and always will be stronger together. People are starved for human connection. We know so very well that we are far from the only ones who have had a difficult year, a traumatic year. We are in this together to grow. It's all preparing us for the Great Awakening event. What's to come, we will be ready for. For days, our loved ones were riding a roller coaster of emotions, anxiety, confusion, desperation, elation, crashing hopes, and finally a fantastic rescue that soothed the bruised hearts and souls of many people. To those who rushed to our rescue even before we knew we needed it, thank you. Thank you to our tribe, our family, our friends for holding space for us during these trying times. We've been unspeakably touched by the incredible support we've received. We will overcome and be able to serve you, serve humanity better than ever in our mission. We are ready to hold space for you as you've done for us. Home is within, but community is truly medicine. In education and parenting, we talk about loving and nurturing the whole child, but ultimately, we are all just children and adult bodies wanting to be nurtured. Our inner child need be nourished holistically as well. Our mission on this planet is to serve you in reaching your higher self and to nurture your whole being, mind, body, and soul by sharing our life experiences and the wisdom we've gained along the way. We proceed with our purpose in holistic wellness and transformation through our daily being. May the light of holistic living shine on you like it has for us and help you to reach self-mastery. If you would like to support our mission, we invite you to share this video or make a donation. You can also stay up to date with our project by subscribing to our newsletter. Thank you for your support. Together, let's build a regenerative future. Pass it on, pass it on, pass it on to the children of the future. To rise and shine. Oh, rise and shine for the next generation. You are, you are, you are the children of the future. You are, you are, you are the children of the future.